Hi, I'm Kim, and you're watching Kim Wilson TV. My channel is dedicated to helping victims of narcissistic abuse get free and stay free. Before I get going with this video, I just want to take a moment to thank our friend Eric very much for your donation to our channel's PayPal account. And I just want to quickly introduce you to our new foster baby. Yes. This is Maddie, and Maddie was found in the street. She's now 12 weeks old, but she was found at about four weeks old, wandering in the streets here in Mexico. And she was at the vets for a while, and we are fostering her until a permanent home can be found. Now, <laughs> something really funny. I'm sure you guys remember my little fluffy dog, Sam. Sam has been to the beauty parlor <laughs> for the first time ever. <laughs> oh, God, she cried like a baby when we dropped her off have to thank you guys for all the great comments that you've left over the years. It is those comments that have really directed the channel. And of course, you know, trying to do videos like the videos I do, I'm constantly having to put myself back, you know, back in that position where I had been victimized, you know, looking for some clarity, trying to assess how I really felt or what was really happening in my life, minus all the brain fog. So, you know, I'm just going to say that would be very, very difficult, uh, soul crushing even, if not for the incredible support you guys have offered me over the years. And I certainly do appreciate it. Yesterday, I did a video and I stated that since, you know, coming to understand what narcissism is, I have been studying the occult on and off. And as I also mentioned yesterday, I have been contacted by seven, and I'm sure they're not going to be the last ones, psychiatrists, uh, American psychiatrists who had given up very lucrative medical careers to study the occult because... Uh, through their experience in dealing with victims of narcissistic abuse and narcissists themselves, they had concluded that the medical profession really could not explain the behaviors and the suffering of victims, and they were leaving their careers to study the occult. So uh, I want to talk about that today because there was a comment that was left, and the comment was left by Diane. And thank you so much, Diane, because this has brought up such an important subject for all of us. Diane says, Studying the occult to get answers is like asking the devil how to get rid of him. I doubt he's going to tell you. Point one that she makes. Now, she does make a couple other points, but just to really stay on topic, at the end she states God is the answer. Anne's question asks me, why would I study the occult if I believed I was being attacked by evil? And I really loved this. And I'll tell you, I certainly was a bit, you know, standoffish when I first considered studying the occult. But why I did go on to study the occult, and to this point I have studied it quite extensively, is first of all, I was looking for some explanation, you know, regarding their level of power over us. While I was with Trevor, I guess I had concluded that he was in charge, that he had some power in the relationship. He certainly did appear to be driving the bus, though he drove it continuously into a brick wall. And during the relationship, I had definitely recognized that I was out of control. You know, he was just charging at every situation, every circumstance, regardless of what the potential outcome was going to be. And it almost always ended disastrously. But in the end, I felt very powerless over what was happening within the relationship. So I guess I had sort of come to the conclusion that he was in charge. And day by day, I was feeling less and less in control. So I think it was creating the illusion that it was him that was in control. So I wanted to better understand if these demons actually do have any, uh, you know, real power or authority or control over the situation. That was a question I had because I thought if they do, well, certainly 
as a community, we're pretty clever. We can figure out a way to get a step ahead of that, but we won't even be looking for a way to get a step ahead of it if we don't understand it or at least acknowledge it is potentially there either way. And uh, in addition to that, I was looking for vulnerabilities. I, I had questions like, do demons have vulnerabilities? I mean, do, is there any limitations that they have? And is there a way we can use use these limitations to our advantage. Narcissists so notoriously target us and just suck information out of us. They want to know everything about us. They appear to be absolutely captivated by us. But what they're actually doing is gathering information to mirror us, information that will later be used against us. So I thought to myself, you know, if there's information out there about demons that we can use to ward off, you know, further injection into our lives or we can ward off future attacks or we can keep ourselves safe if we are stuck in these narcissistic relationships I thought why not let's go to the source and see what they got to say what I discovered is that demons really do not have any power or authority over us until <laughs> until something happens and this something that has to happen really does uh, fall back now not on their strength but on their weakness on their vulnerabilities and the limitations that well demons have to comply with and demons most certainly do have limitations in fact there are two that really stand out and if you understand these two limitations that all narcissists, all demons are bound by, you are going to be able to spot a potential attack well in advance. You're going to be able to protect yourself when you are in the grip of a narcissistic uh, relationship. Or if you're trying to plan your exit strategy out, out of the relationship, I really think knowing these two things is paramount to victims keeping their self safe. Now, one of the very real limitations that a narcissist has is a narcissist is enslaved to what I call the narcissistic hamster wheel. They get in the hamster wheel and they must run it. They must continue to run it. They never get to stop. They never get off. They are very much enslaved to this cycle of idealization, devaluing, dumping, discard, and around they go again. Now, for victims who have been with a narcissist for a long time, uh, and I was only with Trevor for five years, but I saw this over and over again, the narcissist will repeat this cycle with the same victim, or they will go find a new victim, or they will recruit a member of the Narcarum for emergency supply, but either way, they are absolutely bound, damned, and condemned to repeating this cycle over and over and over again. Trying to understand that narcissists are enslaved to the narcissistic hamster wheel. Man, oh man, did I find this liberating. I mean, exciting. It was one of those aspects of narcissistic abuse. You know, when you come across something like this, man, I was feeling pretty good because I think for a lot of victims, we get this feeling like, you know, the narc is going to dump us. We are going to be wallowing in misery, broken hearted, sad. We're going to be alone. And the narc has, you know, just skipped off on to the new victim and they're you know living this happy life they've met someone new someone better than us which makes us feel even worse and you know they've just skipped off to have this wonderful life and that is absolutely a lie it is us who are set free not them they are condemned damned to just keep running this hamster wheel that's all they've done is they've just started the cycle again they cannot get off the hamster wheel not ever they will continue to run it very much enslaved to it where we actually get to walk away it is us who walks away not them and discovering this through research in the occult was incredibly liberating to me because it certainly didn't feel that way. It looked like me who was stuck. It looked like it was him that was going off to have a good life. Wrong is the exact 
polar opposite. We walk away with our free will intact, with the ability to create any number of possibilities in our life, not them. They are stuck forever running that hamster wheel. Victims certainly do identify when the relationship is coming apart that someone's going to be skipping off to have a good time and someone else is going to be left behind wallowing in misery and of course for all of us we believe we're the ones left behind wallowing in misery and that is simply not the case. They are completely enslaved. They have to just keep repeating this cycle. It is us who gets to walk away with our free will, with possibilities not yet realized. It's us that have possibilities, opportunities, and you know all these wonderful things can happen for us if we let them, not for them. Nothing is going to change for them. They are forever on that hamster wheel. And I got to tell you, wow, did I feel great coming to understand this. Another vulnerability, another limitation that a narcissist has is, well, quite simply, a demon cannot attack you without you giving it permission. Now, <laughs> the problem with that is, the way they obtain our consent is through lies, deception, you know, causing us to be, you know, feeling very confused, destabilized, disorientated. It can be very subtle and very, very covert. Now, I'm just going to tell you a quick story. You guys know Trevor and I live together in Trevor's House of Pain. Trevor didn't own the House of Pain. Trevor is a bum. Trevor's mother owned the House of Pain. Now, as a guest in the house, and certainly I'm not a freeloader, it was uh, our intention, I thought, you know, future faking, that we were going to renovate the house. And the way Trevor presented it to me, of course, was quite subtle, uh, you know, quite covert. And the whole idea was that since his mother owned the house, it kind of meant that he owned the house. And since we lived there together, for me to kind of be an equal partner in the relationship and in the house, I should be paying for all the renovations on the house. And guess what? I did consent to that. Ultimately, that cost me, well, about $30,000 overall. And the financial abuse in the relationship was absolutely, uh, uh, my God, I'm going to be digging myself out, you know, probably for the rest of my lifetime. And though I will be 59 um, early in 2020, um, yeah, I'm still a year out from ever getting an early pension and will probably be working until I'm well into my 70s trying to recover, you know, the financial damage that he caused. So an example of me giving permission for Trevor to financially abuse me. Uh, one night, he's out in the garage, I'm in the house, we had decided collectively that we would renovate the upstairs bathroom, and of course I was going to pay for all the materials, he was going to do the labor, and I was going to pay for all the materials. Okay, so, uh, we go out and we buy tiles. The tile's about $3,000, and the tiles are all out in the garage, and one night he's out there, I'm in the house, he comes out and he says, hey, come take a look at this, I've got an idea for a pattern for the tile. Uh, he was sinking floor to ceiling. I go out, I take a look. What I saw was, I, I can't even tell you. Trevor is a fairly skilled tile setter, and Trevor does have, have a, you know, a fairly respectable sense of aesthetics. He had this tile laid out on the floor in a way I cannot even describe to you. It was so horrendously, brutally ugly. The pattern was going in every bloody direction as it was. I hated the color of the tile. I thought it was a really bad choice, but didn't want to argue with it. He's got this pattern laid out, so he's got a cut, a million cuts. And throughout the body of the tile job, there's going to be a million cut edges, like raw edges. I'm just like, oh my God, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I was in absolute utter shock. In fact, uh, 
yeah, I, I, I didn't know what to say. And I didn't want to become reactive. I had just spent $3,000 on these tiles. I just felt sick. I, I didn't want to argue with him. I didn't want to start any kind of fight with them. Um, it had been a couple of days at calm, probably because I had spent the $3,000 on the tiles. So I just said, you know, okay, whatever you think. I gave consent. I then went in and went to bed. Now I say to him the next morning when he's dropped me off at work, you know, why don't we talk about those tiles when I get home? Because I mean, I've got to say something, you know, I've, but okay, I've already given consent. Oh God, I'm getting all flustered just talking about it. So anyways, he picks me up from work that night. He's all excited, narc smirk on his face. He's already done the tile job. It was beyond uh, horrendous. I, I mean, it looked more like vandalism in the bathroom than a home renovation. I mean, truly, it looked like vandalism. I had no words. I was absolutely stupefied. I thought, oh, my God, um, what are we going to do? I mean, it, it truly was bad. So anyways, his mother comes over a couple nights later. She says, how's the bathroom? I said, you know, you got to go look yourself. She screams when she's in there. She comes out like, what the heck happened in there? I said, yeah, I, I, I don't know. So we get Trevor, we sit him down, we explain to Trevor that that tile has got to come off the wall and reminded him that he's got a better sense of aesthetic than that. You know, he's able to lay tile much better than that. And what he had done was certainly not acceptable. I mean, she owned the house, and she recognized it as vandalism. I was paying for it. I recognized it as vandalism. So ultimately what happened is he, he well, I helped. We had to get that tile off the wall. We had to smack it all off, and I had to go buy another $3,000 worth of tile. So what had happened there, and of course he's narc smirking all the while because He'd ask me, you know, really up front, hey, look at this mess. Um, I'm about to financially abuse you. You know, will you give me permission, which I did. And just in that one, you know, one week project that cost me $6,000, uh, to which I fully consented. I've got a lot more to say about this subject, but this video is getting kind of long, so I'm going to cut it off now, and I think what I'll do is the second part, okay? I'm Kim. You're watching Kim Wilson TV. I hope you're having a great NARC-free day, and I'll see you guys in a few minutes in part two.